Today we are talking about uh, democratization trends this morning and then rule of law and security governance in the afternoon. So I hope you're ready for um, an intense day. We're, we're excited for it. So to start off today, um, we'll start with session nine, a current session on democratization trends. And there are a couple of um, learning objectives and sharing objectives that we have uh, for you at this panel. We're hoping that this panel will help us collectively examine progress, challenges, and opportunities African countries face in achieving representative democratic governance and the security implications of democracy. We will discuss some of the major challenges of constitutional politi political succession and military coups, particularly as they relate to government performance and public perceptions of democratic dividends. And we will also provide some material so that we can explore together the relationship between the politics of democratization and security in Africa. So I have with me here two distinguished panelists to help us take on these complex questions today. First, we have Dr. Joseph Siegel. He leads the Africa Center's research program, which produces the Africa Center's Africa security briefs, research papers, special reports, spotlights, and infographics series. These series have the aim of generating policy relevant analyses that contribute to addressing Africa's security challenges. Dr. Siegel's research interests include understanding the role of governance in advancing security and development, he also looks at security trends in Africa, as well as the stabilization of fragile states. Dr. Siegel has been working in and on Africa since the 1980s, and he is the co-author of The Democracy Advantage, How Democracies Promote Prosperity and Peace. He also writes widely for leading policy journals and newspapers and regularly does media as a media analyst uh, on a regular basis as well. So welcome, Dr. Siegel. We also have with us today, Dr. Chris Fumunio. He is currently Senior Associate and Regional Director for Central and West Africa at the National Democratic Institute here in Washington, DC. He has organized and advised international election observation missions to Benin, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Ivory Coast, Ethiopia, Ghana, Liberia, Madagascar, Mali, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone. He has also designed and supervised country-specific democracy support programs with civic organizations, political parties, and legislatures in a variety of different countries, Benin, Burkina, Burundi, Ivory Coast, DRC, the Gambia, Ghana, Guinea, Liberia, Mali, Madagascar, Niger, Nigeria, Rwanda, Senegal, and Togo. So many of you probably hear the names of your countries in this list of places Dr. Fumunio has worked recently. In the course of his work, he interacts regularly with heads of state and government, cabinet ministers, elected officials, and political and civic leaders. Of note, he recently designed and helped to launch the African Statesman Initiative, which is a program aimed at facilitating political transitions in Africa by encouraging former democratic heads of state, to stay engaged in humanitarian issues, conflict mediation, public health, and other key sectors of political, economic, and human development on the continent. Um, so we have a great lineup of speakers with a wealth of knowledge to share with us. And we also hope, as usual, that you all will bring lots of um, questions uh, for our panelists in the question and answer portion of this panel. So with that, I think we will turn to the presentations. Uh, we will start with Dr. Siegel. Dr. Siegel will introduce to us what democracy is, why democracy and democratization are important for defining Africa's security landscape, and particularly for delivering citizen safety and security. Uh, he will describe some of the current positive and negative trends for democracy on the continent and connect that to their significance for security. And then he'll discuss a bit on what African leadership should do now um, uh, to overcome democratization challenges in the current security environment on the continent. After that, Dr. Fumunio will build on Dr. Siegel's assessment of these positive and negative trends for democracy and talk about what he thinks accounts for why some African countries have made more progress with democracy than others. He will discuss the role that African youth play in democratic governance 
and talk about what interests young security sector leaders like you have in advancing democracy in their countries, and briefly touch on the role that external actors um, play in promoting democracy on the continent and how they should or should not be engaged. I'm sure you all have opinions and contributions on these issues too, so then we will open it up for questions. All right, with that, um, I've laid out how this panel will work. I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Siegel to give the first presentation. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Kat. Um, and good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here speaking with you. And as always, it's a great honor and privilege to be on the same panel with the, the venerable Dr. Chris Fumunia, uh, from whom I'm always uh, learning quite a lot. All right, Kat has asked us, to talk about democratic trends in Africa. And so I thought to help get us started, I would give us some historical context from which we can reflect on the present moment. Now, from the 1950s up until the 2000s, the dominant thinking about governance in low-income countries was that you needed a strong man that is only with an authoritarian leader who could uh, marshal the limited resources in a country, who could set a clear vision, have a long-term strategy, that you could build the infrastructure, that you could create the human, human capital, that you could develop literacy and urbanization from which you could then democratize. You know, this was a very compelling argument. And in fact, it was the dominant way of thinking for many decades. There was just one problem with that theory and that it wasn't borne out by facts on the ground. There were many low-income countries, including in Africa, that had authoritarian governments and they didn't develop. And if they didn't develop, then they were deemed never ready for democracy. And so it was a vicious circle. Um, moreover, the empirics told us something differently. And looking at this uh, in terms of results, using Freedom House's spectrum of governance types, and they rank all countries every year based on their level of civil liberties and political rights. And they have categories of free, partly free, and not free countries. So the free countries are your democracies, your not free countries are your autocracies. And looking at Africa's experience since the 1990s, in fact, we've seen that Africa's democracies have actually realized per capita economic growth a third faster than the autocracies. If we look at social development indicators, there's a host of measures, but just to lay out a few, um, infant mortality rates in Africa's democracies are about 40% lower. Chances of attaining secondary education are about 40% higher. Foreign direct investment is 30% is higher. And this all ties up into life expectancy, which in democracies in Africa have been about nine years longer than in autocracies. Um, we see this in other uh, dimensions as well with regards to corruption. You know, the median ranking for Africa's democracies on Transparency International's annual corruption perception index is uh, right around the middle, you know, 88th around, um, among uh, 180 countries. For Africa's autocracies, it's in the bottom quartile of that list. With regards to security, um, Africa's autocracies have been far more conflict prone. That continues to today. Of Africa's 18 autocracies today, 10 are in conflict. So it's about 56%. In comparison of the eight democracies on the continent, none are in conflict. Um, and Africa's military governments historically have had a particularly abysmal track record performing even worse compared to other authoritarian systems in terms of economic development, social development, handling corruption, and managing uh, uh, instability. 
So the bottom line is that despite the conventional thinking that has dominated uh, our approach to these issues for many decades, democracies and democratizers in Africa have actually done relatively better. And in fact, democracy did take root in Africa after the end of the Cold War in the early 1990s. At that time, we saw just two uh, African countries that qualified as democracies. There were over 40 countries that were autocracies. But over the next decade and succeeding decades, uh, that gradually changed. There were more and more democracies. You know, for most of the past decade, we've seen eight to 10 countries qualified as, as democracies. Whereas the number of autocracies uh, fell precipitously. Um, so multi-partyism, uh, uh, opening up of civil liberties, um, uh, more opportunity for freedom of expression. And, uh, you know, for most of the past decade, we've seen, you know, 12 to 14 African countries with authoritarian governments. The vast majority, of course, some 30 plus countries were in the middle. They're in this partly free um, category of governance. Nonetheless, you know, by 2019, um, a majority of African governments were democratic leaning, you know, 31 of the 54. Um, and so substantial progress had been made. And this progress on governance was accompanied by um, a lot of other positive attributes. Over the 25 year period or so where we uh, had the democrat democratization process unfolding in Africa, Africa had uh, uh, positive economic growth every year. On average, Africa had 4% uh, you know, economic growth during this time period. This is particularly notable because it came on the heels of what were called the lost decades of the 1980s and 1990s, where Africa actually contracted economically. We've also seen, you know, we also saw decreases in financial crises and cases of hyperinflation during this time period. There also a drop in the number of coups. Now, there were 82 coups in Africa between 1960 and 2000. That dropped by 60% over the next 15 years. And we also saw a drop in the number of conflicts. Um, at the beginning of the 1990s, there were 12 African countries in conflict, and that declined to about seven uh, by 2010. So there were many positive trends that accompanied the, the shift, shift towards, towards democratization. democratization. In recent years, though, as we're all aware there's been significant backsliding on the continent. And with it, we're hearing echoes of the old arguments that you know, democracy has failed, that you know, democracy is not suited for Africa, that there's a, uh, that you have to choose between either democracy or security. Now, never mind that those arguments are often being made by those who seize power or by external actors who are pushing out that information through disinformation campaigns for their own interest. But nonetheless, those messages are out there. And, you know, we've seen since 2020, there have been six coups on the continent. Um, you know, since 2015, there are 13 African leaders who have evaded term limits and have uh, remained in office. This has contributed to the fact that we, you know, for those, for those countries where leaders have evaded term limits, on average, they've been in office for 18 years. In contrast, in countries where leaders have upheld term limits, their average time in office is just four years. So very, you know, diverging pathways forward. Um, as a result of this backsliding, we've also seen a reversal in the numbers of countries that are democratic leaning. Today, in fact, it's flipped. 31 African countries are uh, autocratic leaning. But again, the justifications for authoritarianism on the continent ring hollow. 
to give an example, we hear from the junta in Mali that the reason they needed to take control was because of the security threat that they were facing from the jihadists. Yet, in every quarter since the junta seized power in August of 2020, the jihadist threat has gotten worse. Indeed, in 2022, the uh, projection is that the number of jihadist attacks will increase by 70% over 2021. This is playing out in terms of violence against civilians in Mali as well, where in the first quarter of 2022, there were more violent attacks by jihadists against civilians than there was in all of 2021 or 2020 or any previous year. Similarly, you know, leaders who stay in power past two terms are also associated with higher levels of repression, corruption, and instability. You know, the attempt to skirt the rule of law by staying in power is not happening in isolation. It's usually part of a broader pattern of evading the rule of law. And uh, indeed, we see this in, in terms of the levels of conflict in these countries. For leaders who've uh, evaded term limits, 40% you know, of those countries are in conflict. In contrast, just 7% of countries where leaders have upheld term limits are currently facing uh, conflict on the continent. And relatedly to these shifts in trends, we've seen an increase in the numbers of conflict on the continent. Today, we have 16 countries in Africa that are facing conflict. So a doubling over the last 10 years. And of those 16, three-fourths are authoritarian leaning, have authoritarian, authoritarian leading governments. So Africa today is at a crossroads. Africa already has a long history of authoritarianism and military government. And we know what kind of outcomes that government model produces. So for those who are calling for a return to military governments or to authoritarian governments, they're really calling for a return to that dark past that Africa has already experienced. You know, this is not a viable way forward. We're really talking about what future that do Africans want for themselves moving forward. So the question really isn't whether democracy or autocracy is superior. The question really is how do we make democracies more effective in Africa? And African citizens themselves regularly are telling Afrobarometer that 75% uh, prefer democracy. That's their preferred form of government for the continent. Citizens want to see democracies perform better, though. And so our task really is to try to learn from Africa's experiences with democratization up to this point. So I'd like to highlight just a couple of overarching lessons from our experiences. Um, the first is that um, you know, democracies are about more than elections. You know, democracy is about a way of governing every day between elections. You know, it's about respecting civil liberties, upholding the rule of law, um, uh, ensuring everybody has uh, rights to political participation. Our overemphasis on elections, while of course important, has allowed certain leaders to manipulate the outcomes of elections and then claim their democracies. Um, they need to be accountable for being democratic every day uh, that they're in power. Second, um, Democracies are all about sharing power and checks and balances against the monopolization and abuse of power. Yet we've seen a stunting in the development of the institutional checks and balances in Africa. You know, these are the institutions that you know, provide the guardrails against abuse. Um, and these are the institutions that those 30 plus countries I mentioned are in the middle um, have uh, not done enough to, to try and build. So 
So what am I talking about? I'm talking about institutions like a stronger legislature um, that can create a check on uh, a way-bound uh, uh, executive. We're talking about independent judiciary. Um, we're talking about diffusion of power to subnational levels of government. So it's not all concentrated um, in the capital. We're talking about an apolitical and merit-based civil service and including a central bank that can help manage the economy. And this also applies to a apolitical and professional military that doesn't get swept up in the politics of the country and ends up um, uh, propping up uh, one political party or leader or another. It's about making sure there's space for a free press in civil society. It's of course about electoral commissions that are independent, respecting term limits. It's about independent private sector so that people who wanna go into business can get credit, can get property, get licenses without having to have political ties. The third overarching lesson I would uh, throw out um, is to recognize that democracies have built in self-correction mechanisms. Um, because of democracy's free press and uh, freedom of expression, when something's going wrong in a democracy, you hear about it. You know, it's in the papers, it's in the, it's on the internet. Uh, people are drawing attention to that. And that's what fosters change. There's pressure on any political leader to um, correct those things that are drawing a lot of attention. It's democracy's early warning system. That's why democracies do a better job of avoid, avoiding crisis. They are constantly self-correcting. And I think the challenge for Africa is how do we develop those tools, let those auto-correct tools work? Um, so for example, if there's a problem with corruption, the solution isn't, well, let's have a coup. The solution is let's deal with the corruption. Let's strengthen legislative authorities to have oversight. Let's empower inspector generals or auditors who can go in and uh, do investigations. Um, in South Africa, when they were dealing with the problem of state capture, it was the public protector's office that did a lot of the groundbreaking uh, investigation work and supported by media and civil society that drew attention to that. If there's a problem with leaders who are staying in power past their time, then it's up to the judiciary to uh, you know, call that out, to uphold the rule of law. And we've seen that in Malawi and Kenya where leaders um, you know, try to overstep their bounds or try to manipulate the electoral outcome. But the high courts there uh, ruled against those incumbents and uh, upheld the, the constitutions. If there's a problem with security, then you know, that's where a country needs to mobilize a national security strategy review and make sure that the uh, country's security sectors are uh, realigning their efforts to the security threats that are happening on the ground. It may require a high level task force that identifies what reforms are needed and, and, and changes business as usual. It institutes the autocorrect mechanism that uh, democracies are, are built on. So in short, every democracy faces problems. Democracies don't mean you don't have problems, but democracies provide you as a means to solve the problems and you just have to use them. So to conclude, I'd like to leave you with the image, um, if we could put up the slide, um, of a ferry boat and a speedboat. If we had our choice to get across a river, most of us would initially want to go with the speedboat. It's fast, it's sleek, streamlined, um, and it looks like it'd be a lot of fun. Um, but the problem is that, you know, that speedboat's only built for a few people to get across. Um, what we don't see is everybody else is left on the, on the shore. In contrast, the ferry boat 
It's not fancy um, and it's crowded. People have probably had to wait in line to get on board. They had to accommodate one another to make space. It's hot, they're under the sun, but it's getting more people across the river. And ultimately, that is what good governance is about. So thank you very much and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Siegel. Um, there are a variety of highlights here, but um, I will not go over them all. I think um, two that stood out, democracy as an early warning system. That could be interesting fodder for discussion. And then the ferry boat and the speedboat is an, uh, a wonderful way to end. Uh, Dr. Fumunio, we'll leave the floor to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tad, for that uh, very warm introduction and warm welcome this morning. It's truly a pleasure to be here and to see a room full of my brothers and sisters from the continent and friends of Africa uh, who are thinking through uh, where the continent is headed and whether we should all get into the ferry boat or into the speedboat. I'm a ferry boat guy, so <laughs> I'll probably go with the ferry boat. I also want to thank uh, my friend and, and brother Joe, uh, Dr. Siegel, for his very illuminating presentation. I think he covered it all, gave a very brilliant and substantive overview of where the continent was, how far it's traveled, what the challenges are, and even more importantly at the end, what the solutions should be. Um, in fact, I was taking some notes as he spoke and I felt like he just you know, gave us um, uh, a prescription for how to resolve all of the issues that uh, our continent faces out there. Uh, let me also give a special shout out to ACSS um, because as I got in, as I entered the room and I walked through and I, you know, scouted the room very quickly, I could see how many of my sisters are participating in this program. And I could hear the voices and it really captured for me the diversity that we have on the continent. Uh, I am told that uh, 30 to 40 percent of the participants in this court are women, and that for me is truly a source of pride. Uh, I really want to thank ACSS for its leadership role on, on many issues, but on this particular issue of women's engagement um, in governance, uh, whether it's political or security, uh, because we as a continent um, have 51 percent of our population that's female. And we're not going to win our security battles, our political battles, our development battles, if we go into this fight with one hand tied behind. So I really commend the fact that we have women leaders here with us. Uh, I hope that you all take that message back to policymakers in your respective countries, and that in the way in which you manage your services or your units, your command positions, that you also internalize that concept and operationalize it as well. Um, in many regards, as you could uh, hear from uh, Dr. Siegel's presentation, uh, the conversation about democracy in Africa today is an easy conversation to have uh, compared to where we were 30 years ago or more than two, two decades ago when some of us started working on these issues. Uh, because the situation is evolved. Uh, the continent still faces its challenges, but then there are also some success stories. So when I stand up to talk about democratization in Africa, uh, I'm going to cite African examples that work. I'm not going to have to look outside of the continent to identify security services that are professional, that respect the rule of law, that safeguard the security and safety of all of the citizens, irrespective of their political affiliation. Those examples are easy to find. I will be able to cite examples of countries that are managing their resources very effectively to the benefit of the masses or of the overall population, as opposed to managing those resources for the benefit of the few. So there, these examples make conversations about democratization easier than the time when uh, in the late 80s 
Uh, we had only four African countries of the 54 countries on the continent that even accepted the concept of multipartism. The fact that people could get together and form political parties to think about how they could contribute to the development of their countries. The other 50 countries were either military regimes or one party rule, one party states. So we had Botswana, we had Mauritius, we had Senegal, and we had the Gambia. And so fast forward to today, progress has been made. There's still a lot of work to be done, but substantial progress has been made. Now, Dr. Kat asked me to zero in on three issues. One is to address the question of why it is that some African countries are doing better than others. Why is it that some countries still continue to struggle and to stumble while other countries are consolidating their democratic processes? And that question got me thinking about a comparative analysis that one could make say of a South Africa that emerged from a very difficult past of the apartheid regime that at one time had the capacity to produce nuclear weapons in the hands of the military that represented a white minority regime. And that could have wiped out not just all of the black population of South Africa, but the frontline states as we call them back then and many other countries in that sub-region. But that went through a transition where everybody bought into the idea of a new and democratic South Africa, where even the military was willing to give out, give away some of its privileges to live in a more just society. Where a leader that has spent 27 years, the most active years of his life in jail, in prison unjustly came out, but was forgiving enough to accept to be the president of all South Africans. And that for me was a remarkable example. And I contrast that with the neighboring country of Zimbabwe that at one point was considered the breadbasket of Southern Africa because of its agricultural productivity that has tremendous human capital. And you can see it in the 5 million plus Zimbabweans that now live as refugees in South Africa. Industrious, hardworking, competent, intelligent, but that had poor leadership, which started off good, but eventually, because of the tendency to perpetrate itself in power, worked so hard to shrink political space, to exclude vast segments of its population from the governing process, to institute such an autocratic role and almost a one-party state that Zimbabwe lost its, its opportunities to grow as a country. I think of Mozambique going back to the 1990s when Mozambique had its conflict between the Renamo rebel movement attacking the, uh, the, the Frelimo led government and how Mozambique was able to go through a peace process in 1992 that led to a peaceful resolution of that conflict. And then ultimately, they had a series of elections that allowed Renamo to transform itself from a rebel movement into, into a, a political, political party and to win some seats and some, some states and be, become part of the governing process of the country. And within that same period of time, Angola, another former Portuguese um, colony that was also going through a tumultuous civil war experimented with bad elections in 1992 and immediately relapsed into armed conflict for another 25, 30 years. 
look at those two countries and see what Mozambique gained or has gained in the past three decades and how much ground Angola lost. Despite the fact that Angola is a blessed country, half of the country sits on oil and the other half sits on diamonds. I think about Cape Verde, small country in the island of the coast of West Africa, that in many ratings on issues of freedoms, democratic governance, transparency, alternation of political power, Cape Verde scores higher than many countries in the Western Hemisphere. In fact, there have even been some debates in academic circles as, as whether Cape Verde, Verde to continue, continue to, be to be classified as a, as a developing, developing country. country. There was once a time in Cape Verde, I believe in 2002, when the presidential election was determined by 20 votes. Because Cape Verdeans in the diaspora participate in the elections of the country, elections of the president. And so when the voting ends, they have to wait for all the votes to come in from the diaspora to do the final count. And so when they first counted in country, one candidate was ahead. But when, when the vote came from the diaspora and the counting was completed, the candidate who was behind took the lead, but there was a difference of between 20 to 30 votes only. The candidate that now found himself 20, 30 votes short was the incumbent. He accepted the outcome. He called his opposition and congratulated him. And the country had a peaceful, peaceful alternation of political power. Cape Verde, despite the fact that it's out in the island, doesn't have a lot of mineral resources, is doing extremely well. And you can contrast that with Guinea-Bissau, its neighbor, that also went through a similar struggle for independence, but has been you know, has stayed, you know, strapped in interminable internal conflicts. When Dr. Siegel was talking about military coups, we remember that up until very recently, there was even yet another attempt at a military coup in Guinea-Bissau, a country that has known a lot of instability. And because of that, the contrast between Cape Verde and Guinea-Bissau is stark. I could go down the list. I could talk about the differences between Benin and Togo. Uh, I could talk about Ghana and Sierra Leone. I, in fact, I remember at one time uh, in the 90s when Sierra Leone was having its challenges uh, with civil war and thank goodness the country has come out of that. Uh, but at the time, we used to discuss how Sierra Leone had diamonds. There was a story uh, carried by New York Times that made the front pages of New York Times at the time, where a young kid in Sierra Leone had escaped the civil war into the bushes and he got hungry and he went you know, looking for food. He dug up a yam and in the process discovered a piece of diamond, uh, which was rated at about, uh, at very highly rated. I believe $500,000 or so a huge, some huge amount. And of course the state took it and made news and got um, front cover on New York Times. And I contrasted that with a country like Botswana and see what Botswana has done to its diamonds. Botswana probably started off where Sierra Leone was in terms of its capacity. But while Sierra Leone at the time back in the 80s went into civil war and lost the opportunity to grow that industry. Botswana has been able to even industrialize its diamond cutting process to the benefit of that country and the entire population. The transparency with which the government of Botswana manages its resources has contributed tremendously 
to the stability that the country enjoys, to the development that the country enjoys, and to the level of employment that's been created for young people. And so in a number of our countries today, we see a restiveness between those that have and those that don't. A restiveness between those that have access to power and those that desire access to opportunities. Joe talked about the Afrobarometer study. It's out there. It's an African organization that talks to Africans, that captures their viewpoints and their opinions, and that continues to state that an overwhelming majority of Africans want to live in democratic societies. At the same time, they are extremely critical of the manner in which they're governed. So what makes it, what makes, what accounts for success in a number of African countries is for me, visionary leadership and the political will to do right for our people. The leaders that have embodied these two elements have done well for their people and their countries. In that whole mix, the security sector has got a crucial role to play. In fact, oftentimes I have said that no transition has succeeded on the African country without the military playing a constructive role. The constructive role doesn't need, mean necessarily that the military gets involved in the political process. A constructive role can mean that the military plays by its own constitutional rules and therefore sets an example that other actors can emulate. I think, for example, about the role that was played by the military or that has been played by the military in Malawi on several occasions. Some of you may remember that in the 80s and 90s, Malawi was one of those countries that had a president for life written into the constitution of the country, President Kamuzu Banda, Dr. Kamuzu Banda. But then as citizens began to clamor for more democracy and more freedoms, the country decided to organize a referendum as to whether to open up the political process uh, for inclusive governance. And of course the president lost. But the ruling party at the time had a militia group that was called the, the, the Young Pioneers that was used to intimidate opposition parties and civil society. And it was the, the army of Malawi that put an end to that intimidation and that demobilized the young pioneers who had been serving as a militia to inhibit political participation in Malawi. And that gesture alone emboldened and empowered Malawians to feel that they could take to the streets and have their voices heard. And that was an instrumental piece to the transition that took place in Malawi in 1994. Again, in 2012, when unfortunately the president of the country passed away suddenly, President Bingu Muturaka, the constitution provided for the vice president to be sworn in. And of course, politicians being whom they are in some countries, there were a lot of machinations about how to make sure that the vice president would not be sworn into office. But it was the military that sent out the first signals to say that the constitution of the country must be respected. And because the message was clear, it was understood by all the actors. The vice president was sworn in to the chagrin of some of the politicians. The country stayed peaceful and stayed on course. And today, Malawi is being cited as one of the countries that continues to make progress on the democratic governance track. These are positive examples 
that I share with you, and I'm sure if we went across the room, we would have more examples to show that the security sector is a crucial pillar in the transformation that many of our countries have experienced and that some still need, but a, a pillar that will help us consolidate uh, democratic governance. We have to contrast that with some of the negative trends that you may have already discussed earlier in the week and that Joe mentioned with unprofessional conduct that in many cases is complicit with the autocratic regimes in helping shrink political space or worse still in having the military interfere with the political process uh, through coups as we now are experiencing in Mali, Burkina Faso and Guinea. Let me also talk about youth, which was my second assignment. Because as we all know, or should know, 70% of the African population is 30 years or younger. Our continent, Africa, is the most youthful continent on the globe. The median age in many African countries is 18, 19 years of age. Therefore, we must collectively cater to that generation, not just for now, but because it also is the Africa of the future. That generation has the particularity of having been born for the most part at a time when the continent was already going through some of the transitions that have been discussed. That generation is very unfamiliar with some of the autocratic practices of the past. That generation also sees itself as made up of citizens of the globe, as global citizens. And with today's technology, I can assure you that that generation spends more time communicating with people and individuals who think alike outside of their national borders than they do with the policymakers in their national capitals. And as policymakers yourselves, I believe you have to be sensitive to the expectations of this generation. That is why, for example, when we look back or we look again at the politics of South Africa, the historic party of the ANC is now having a lot of difficulties. It's been losing ground in almost every election. And that's not a partisan judgment. It's just because the younger generation of South Africans no longer make decisions based on the anti-apartheid struggle because they were not part of it or they were not adults at the time. They make those decisions now based on the legitimacy of the government and the performance of the government. And that's how this younger generation makes its judgments based on the effectiveness, the efficiency of public service and their perceptions of their well-being as guaranteed by the current government. So performance matters because performance is what also guarantees legitimacy. There has been some debate about the coups that we mentioned, about the fact that in many of these countries, the military goes after regimes that have already lost their legitimacy. A lot of their legitimacy is lost through poor performance. Because once leaders get into office, some of them forget that they are being judged by their citizens on a daily basis. But this is how the younger generation sees their relationship to the state. In the big country of Nigeria, 
you know, you can't talk about Africa without talking about Nigeria. <laughs> we all know how difficult it is to keep that balance of over 200 million people with very diverse religious affiliation, but all very attached to their religion with ethnic identity, which is strong and powerful and historic with each entity holding very strong to its ethnic identity. And with the fact that the 1998-1999 Constitution of Nigeria tried to walk a very delicate line to maintain the federal char character of the country. And so constitutional reform in Nigeria is extremely difficult because those who designed that constitution wanted to make sure that nobody would be able to think of it. But between 2016 and 2018, just in a two year period, something remarkable happened. The young people of Nigeria decided that they were going to mobilize themselves to get the country to amend its constitution to reduce the age of access to political office in Nigeria. And so they launched a campaign called Not Too Young to Run. And the objective of the campaign was to make sure or to obtain that the age requirement to run for office in Nigeria could be reduced to the advantage of young people. Nobody took them seriously when they started in 2016. But in just two years, they had mobilized across all of Nigeria. They had representation in all 36 states, in all 774 local government areas. They began lobbying members of parliament in the House, in the Senate. They began writing petitions, using social media to sensitize the Nigerian public to this issue. And by 2018, they had gotten the National Assembly of Nigeria, both houses, to adopt the age reduction bill, which President Buhari then signed into law in two years' time. And that has been the one uh, almost sole amendment to the Nigerian constitution of 1998-1999. Right now, the age limitation for house members in Nigeria has been reduced from 30 years to 20, 25 years, for senators and governors from 35 years to 30 years, and for president from 40 years to 30 years. So a young, brilliant, dynamic, active Nigerian who is 30 years old can aspire to be the president of his or her country. We did see that because of this new legislation, during the elections of 2019, the participation of young Nigerians in the political process heightened. More of them got elected in positions in their states, in local government areas, and at the national level. And today, as the world has embraced as one of its priorities, the intergenerational debate or discussion on how to integrate young people in the political process, Nigeria in many ways has become the showpiece of an example of what can work. It is in our collective interest to make sure that these young people can channel their energies, their talent into the political process. Because as security experts and officers and policymakers, you know that if these young people don't channel their energies in the right direction, they're going to become even more vulnerable to some of the trends that you all have discussed in the Sahel dread of violent extremism. They will become easy prey and easy recruitment ground for high crimes that will make human security unattainable in many of your countries. In a nutshell, and I'll try to wrap up very quickly, let me just say that with regards to external actors, 
First, that nobody wants to prescribe to Africans how to build their international relationships. That we as Africans see ourselves as part of the globe and therefore should interact with all actors across the globe. The, diff the challenge that we see is in the narrative that various actors try to use in their relationship with the African continent that will be prejudicial to the interests of the African people. That we have superpowers coming into the continent today that are using the narrative that has failed our people in the past 50 to 60 years. We see them using the same tactics that they criticized before when we complained about colonialism. And so whether it's Saudi Arabia being extremely active in Sudan in a negative way and trying to prop up the Sudanese military against its citizens or the Chinese exploiting our minerals in the same way that they heard us criticize the colonial powers for extracting African minerals without transparency on contracts, without creating jobs for locals, or the Russians pretending to be saviors when they can't be credited with any specific development projects that have improved lives on the continent that we all need to pause and ask ourselves whether this is being done for the benefit of our continent. And my hope is that as Africa continues to play on the international arena, that we would find ways to leverage all of these relationships with a lot of discernment in a way that could be beneficial to our people. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Fumunio um, and Dr. Siegel for very complimentary presentations. Um, we'll go very soon um, to question and answer. So please have uh, your hands ready to raise for that. Just to summarize, you know, some key lessons um, that were presented. Democracies are more than elections. It's about how we govern every day. Uh, power sharing checks and balances are a key part of building strong institutions that can promote democracy and thereby security. Um, this idea of democracy is an early warning system that Dr. Siegel brought up. Um, there are self-correction mechanisms there that could be useful um, and, and pointing to the importance of uh, independent judiciaries and legislatures in, in, in uh, providing some of these uh, mechanisms for correction. Um, in terms of the ferry boat and the speedboat, I think we even have uh, the, the picture still up over here on this side. Um, it's interesting, Dr. Fumunio raises uh, the resource that's out there for everyone, the Afrobarometer Public Opinion Surveys. He mentioned th these are, this is an African set of African um, uh, opinion, opinion pollers, pollers um, who, are who are professionally, professionally trained, trained how to do representative, representative opinion, opinion polling through sampling in 34 different African countries. They've, They've been, been doing this since 1999 in various places. places. There are, there are eight, eight different, different rounds of this survey, survey and, and they, they go household to household according to a statistical um, methodology to get a representative sample of what people in 34 different countries on the continent think. And as both speakers pointed out, there is there's extreme, extreme demand, demand for democracy, for democracy. about three quarters of African citizens, citizens in those 34, 34 countries um, think, think democracy is a, the, 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 best the best form of government, government and reject uh, other, other forms of rule, like, like uh, one party rule, personalist rule, military rule. Um, um, in, 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 terms in terms of the very uh, 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 example, example, there's a really there's interesting, interesting recent finding from the latest round of the Afrobarometer survey showing what our two speakers were talking about. In addition to preferring democracy as a form of government, most, Most of those, those who were surveyed, surveyed prefer, prefer a slower, a slower but, more but more responsive form of, form of governance under a, under a democracy than, than a, very a very speedy response, speedy response that isn't that responsive, responsive to citizen, citizen needs um, 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 under, under, um, uh, in, in terms of how, how they would prefer their, prefer their governance. governance. So, so that, that really made me think of the very very model, model versus, versus the speed model, speed model, 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 model of what you can, what get, you can get out of government. So just to add to the example that we have here on the screen. And then, of and then, of course, this idea, this idea Dr. Dr. Chris, Chris, we appreciate the idea that militaries can play a constructive role in transition. They can, they can set, set the example and, um, and um, set the example, set the example of, following of following the constitutional rules so that these self-correction mechanisms can work. Can work. Um, so, um, so I will so stop, I will stop talking. talking. That's just a, just a um, short, short overview of things that you might have taken um, 